The castles of Britain, grand and beautiful, majestic and imposing. Some have been maintained throughout the centuries, but others have been forgotten, left to decay into history by ages past. But why were they built? Who were the men and women that built them? What events took place within and around their walls? And what stories can these age structures tell us today? Join me as I take a brief dive into the history of the castles of Britain. Today we take a brief dive into the history of Harlech Castle in Gwynedd, Wales. Harlech Castle lies in the county of Gwynedd next to the Irish Sea in northwest Wales. The history of Harlech Castle is incredible and begins in 1283 with King Edward I of England's conquest of Wales. For decades prior to this, the Welsh and the English had battled for supremacy over disputed areas in Wales, and one man, Llewellyn Up Griffith, had emerged as a troublesome and capable opponent of the English. He was, at the time, the prince of the most powerful principality in Wales, Gwynedd, the county in which Harlot Castle now lies, and he was soon able to unite much of Wales under his control, taking on the title of Prince of Wales after being successful in this endeavor. King Edward I, known as Longshanks, came to the throne after his weak father Henry III had died, and Edward was intent on bringing the Welsh and Griffith to heel. Llewellyn had led successful advances into English-controlled territory during the reign of Henry III, and his title as Prince of Wales and his territorial gains were recognized by Henry III in 1267, which was done in return for Llewellyn paying homage to Henry. However, Llewellyn continued to quarrel with the so-called Marcher Lords, which were powerful English lords who controlled territory on the border of England and Wales. When Edward became king, he harbored some of Llewellyn's enemies, which happened to include, at the time, his brother David, who had fallen out with Llewellyn and who had defected over to the English side. This, mixed with the continued dispute with the Marcher Lords, caused Llewellyn in a rage to refuse to pay homage to Edward, the new king, thus bringing forth the next serious conflict between the English and the Welsh. In 1276, Edward declared war on Llewellyn and invaded a year later in 1277. He advanced into Wales from multiple directions, including from the south, the east, and eventually the north, utilizing different armies led by other capable men to put pressure on Llewellyn and his forces. This eventually caused Llewellyn to surrender in November 1277 after Edward made serious gains with his advances into Wales. Edward was forgiving and relatively generous, allowing Llewellyn to retain the title of Prince of Wales. But the king put limitations on the territory that Llewellyn could control in Gwynedd, which left Llewellyn frustrated. Edward, sensing that the Welsh could and probably would remain a serious thorn in his side, decided to begin a massive program of castle building, which was begun in 1277, although Harlech was not one of the castles that was begun at this time. By 1282, Llewellyn's brother David, disgruntled by what he had attained, or not attained, by supporting the English in their quarrel with his older brother, rebelled and was reconciled to Llewellyn. A rebellion once again emerged. Edward, frustrated by yet another uprising in Wales, decided that he would no longer settle for appeasement with Llewellyn and the Welsh. Instead, conquest would now be the main goal of his new expedition, and in 1282, a three-pronged attack was again launched from the south, east, and north, with Edward taking part in the northern prong of the attack. Llewellyn was killed in December 1282, and this, in part, allowed Edward to march into the heart of Welsh resistance. Edward's northern force was able to march south down the Conwy Valley, towards where Harlech now stands, with Conwy Castle being begun during this time as well. Edward's force attacking from the east, led by Sir Otto de Grandison, was also able to break through and make their way to Harlech, where the castle was begun immediately in 1283. This was a continuation of Edward's program of castle building in Wales, which, as we already touched on, had begun in 1277 and was in full force by 1283. The purpose of this so-called Iron Ring of Castles, as they are now called, was to have strongholds in order to be able to enforce English rule on the populace in Wales, 
and this program would be perhaps one of the greatest castle building programs in world history. All in all, 14 major castles would have construction commenced, and the castles that would emerge from this program would be some of the most incredible building works in the world. The construction of Harla Castle was quick, relatively speaking, as hundreds of masons were sent to the area in order to continuously work on the imposing structure. By 1289, the castle was virtually finished, which meant that it was, in essence, constructed in only six years. It is believed that Edward himself stayed at the castle twice in 1284 and in 1294-95. Harlech was besieged by Madog ap Llewellyn, a Welshman who rose up against the continued English rule in Wales and what he perceived to be unfair taxation practices implemented by the English. Madog was a distant relative to Llewellyn and Daffid ap Griffith and again attempted to use the title of Prince of Wales to gain legitimacy. Harlech during this time was cut off from England by land and at one point only had 37 men guarding the fortress. Ultimately, Madog was captured and imprisoned with the rebellion coming to an end by 1295. Although Edward I was successful in conquering Wales and was able to keep it under his control until his death in 1307, this was certainly not the end of Harlech's importance in the grand scheme of things. There were still many more events that would take place at Harlech over its lifetime and it would remain an important stronghold for many more centuries. Harlech's history, however, differs slightly from some of the other historic British castles due to the fact that for much of its existence, Harlech remained in the possession of the crown, whereas other castles oftentimes were owned by powerful lords and shifted between families over the centuries. The latter half of the 14th century saw little action for Harlech, but by the start of the 15th century, some of the most interesting events in Harlech's history came about. It was in the year 1400 that a man named Owen Glendower started his uprising against the first Lancastrian king, Henry IV. Owen Glendower was a Welshman who served in England for many years, studying law, gaining military experience, and marrying an Englishwoman during his life. He was descended from the ancient Welsh royal families, but had ties to both Wales and England. After coming into dispute with the crown when the new king, Henry IV, came to the throne, Glendour instigated a 15-year-long revolt against English rule in Wales. In 1401, an attack on Harlech was suppressed when archers and men-at-arms from Chester were dispatched to relieve the castle. But by 1403, the Glendour Rebellion, as it would eventually become known, had spread significantly to the point that many castles in North and West Wales had become isolated. Harlech, being on the west coast of Wales and one of the most western strongholds, was of course one of these isolated outposts and was said to have only had 10 men-at-arms and 30 archers during this time. A mutiny crisis soon ensued, where the constable of the castle at the time, a man named William Hunt, was suspected of prepping the castle to hand over to the Welsh. His soldiers mutinied and seized him, placing two other men in his place, a man referred to as Sir Lewis and a man named Fivian Collier. But disease and hunger ravaged the small garrison to the point that many began to desert or attempt to escape back to England. Eventually, the garrison was forced to hand Harlech over to the Welsh forces loyal to Glendour in 1404, the castle thereafter becoming a main residence of Glendour himself, who was said to have even called parliaments there as the opposition Prince of Wales, the future Henry V already holding that title at the time. Eventually, Glendour's rebellion would spread even further throughout Wales and indeed into England as well. In 1402, Glendour had defeated and captured a man named Edmund Mortimer, who had been loyal to the monarchy up to that point, and who was a descendant of Edward III. In fact, it would be through Edmund Mortimer's family line that the House of York would ultimately trace their claims to the English throne during the Wars of the Roses. Edmund, while in captivity, defected to Glendower's cause and took up arms against the crown. Edmund Mortimer's sister was married to a man named Henry Percy, nicknamed Hotspur, who, along with his father, the Earl of Northumberland, had been instrumental in assisting Henry IV in his push to overthrow Richard II and attain the throne for himself. But soon the Percys became disgruntled with Henry IV and joined forces with Owen Glendour and Edmund Mortimer, Mortimer by that time having married Glendour's daughter. Hotspur would be defeated by Henry IV and the future Henry V's forces at Shrewsbury, with the Earl of Northumberland being forgiven for a time. However, it was not long before Northumberland was added again and once again entered into another alliance with Mortimer and Glendour via the so-called tripart indenture, which in essence agreed to split up England and Wales between the three of them if Henry IV was defeated. However, things would end badly for all three of these individuals. 
Between 1408 and 1409, English forces under the command of the English Prince of Wales, Prince Hal, the future Henry V, were sent to Harlech where a siege was conducted. Also at the siege was John Talbot, the eventual Earl of Shrewsbury, who would go on to be a successful military commander and who would eventually be killed at the final battle of the Hundred Years' War, the Battle of Castillon on the continent. During the siege at Harlech, the castle was battered by cannon fire and the castle was eventually forced to capitulate to English forces. Edmund Mortimer perished during or immediately after the siege, probably of starvation. Glendor managed to escape capture, but his wife, daughters, and granddaughters were not so lucky. They were all captured and transferred to the Tower of London, where most eventually died. The Earl of Northumberland was also eventually defeated and killed as well. Although Glendor escaped capture, he would never hold the same prominence that he once did after Harlech's fall. He eventually disappeared, most likely dying of natural causes, still on the run from English forces. After Harlech's recapture in 1409, it would not play a significant role, militarily speaking, until the Wars of the Roses began in 1455. After the Yorkist leaders, which included the future Edward IV, his father Richard Duke of York, and the kingmaker, the Earl of Warwick, had been forced to flee to Ireland and the continent, they eventually mounted a successful push back into England, which culminated in the king at the time, Henry VI, being captured at Northampton in 1460. Henry VI's wife, Margaret of Anjou, was forced to flee after this battle and did so to Harlech, the castle being a Lancastrian stronghold at the time. It soon became clear that the Yorkists would need to capture Harlech to remove it as a base of power for the Lancastrians. Edward IV sent William Herbert to lay siege to the castle in 1468, and he, along with his brother, captured the castle with the defenders holding out for a month before surrendering. This was the last major Lancastrian stronghold to capitulate to the Yorkists during the Wars of the Roses, but as we will see, this will not be the last time that Harlech was the final holdout in a major war. As the years passed by, repairs were sparse at Harlech, and it soon began to fall into disrepair. It was still used as a prison for debtors and felons, but all in all, the state of the castle continued to go downhill. During the reign of Elizabeth I, what was known as the Marianeth Assizes, Essentially, civil and criminal courts were held at Harlech, so it is believed that the gatehouse and its living quarters were at least functional at this time. In the 17th century, during the time of the English Civil Wars, the castle once again came into prominence when it was held as a royalist stronghold for King Charles I by a man named Colonel William Owen of Brigantin. In 1646, the parliamentarians laid siege to the castle with Major General Thomas Mitten capturing it in March 1647. Just as it had been during the Wars of the Roses, Harlech was the last castle to hold out in the war, and its capture signaled the end of the First English Civil War. Never again would the castle be used in such a way. The castle over the following centuries continued to deteriorate to the point that it eventually morphed into a picturesque ruin. Due to the nature of its use, Harlech had for much of its life remained as crown property, but in 1914, care of the castle transferred to the Office of Works. Today, Harlech is maintained by the Historic Monument Maintenance Branch of the Welsh Government, CADU, and is today, incredibly, designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Let us now take a brief look at the construction and layout of Harlech Castle. Harlech Castle sits near the coast in the northwest Welsh county of Gwynedd. It sits atop a large rock, and although the castle and rock today is about a kilometer or 0.63 miles from the edge of the Irish Sea today, in medieval times, the water would have come right up to the rock itself. The rock itself had what was at one time a water gate to the northwest of the castle, which is accessed by following a long staircase and a walkway, which was historically known as, quote, the way from the sea. An upper gate also existed near the top of the rock, as one got closer to the castle. The castle itself was protected by the rock slash sea on the west and north sides, but on the east and south sides of the castle, it was protected by a rock cut ditch, these sides of the castle being the most susceptible to attack. The castle has an outer ward, which concentrically surrounds an inner ward, with the outer ward containing a corbelled latrine slash trash chute on the south side of it. The north side of the outer ward, also has a gate with staircase access to the northern rock, and the east side of the outer ward contains the main entrance to the castle, 
where bridges would have given access to the outer ward through two, now mostly destroyed, towers. There are corbelled turrets protecting the entrance of the outer ward, which we will take a look at in a moment. As one moves closer to the center of the castle, the inner ward would be entered, either through the main gate passage or through the two small entrances on either the west or north sides. The inner ward is quadrangular and contains four towers on each of its corners to the northwest, southwest, southeast, and northeast. The northwest and southwest corner towers do have turrets extending up to a greater height above them, whereas the northeast and southeast towers do not. There is also a large two-towered gatehouse in the east curtain wall, which held domestic accommodation, something we will discuss in more detail shortly, and had two spiral staircase turrets projecting from its rear or west side. The interior of the inner ward consisted of multiple domestic structures, including on the north wall, a bakehouse, well, and chapel, on the west wall, a great hall, the buttery, pantry, and kitchen, and on the south wall, the granary and an additional hall. As stated previously, access to the outer ward could be gained through the western and northern walls. As far as timing of construction goes, much of the castle was constructed in a short period of time, relatively speaking, between 1283 and 1289. The overall plan was known and set out from the beginning of construction, with the main inner curtain wall being started at this time, although the walls were not originally raised to the height that they stand today, nor were they built to the thickness that they stand today. The two eastern towers and gatehouse were begun during this time as well. The curtain walls would be later heightened and thickened, with the north and south curtain walls being thickened on their interior, while the west curtain wall was thickened on its exterior. The two western towers were also begun during this later stage. Work on the lower part of the gatehouse is thought to have progressed significantly in 1284 and 1285, with the outer ward walls, its turrets, and its latrine probably being begun during this time as well. By 1289, construction was essentially complete, with the western towers having had their turrets completed, the tower already housing a constable, and the interior structures all having been completed. The water gate, upper gate, and quote, way from the sea path down the rock had also been completed by this time as well, although not all of the construction on the rock happened during this phase of building. After Madag ap Llewellyn's rising in 1295, the northern part of the rock was enclosed. The last serious update to Harlech took place during the reign of Edward II in 1323, when two towers were erected in the center of the eastern ditch, which acted as a gateway entrance to the castle. These towers are now destroyed, but their foundations can still be seen today. Let us now take a look at what remains at Harlech Castle to this day. Although we will not touch on every feature of Harlech Castle that can still be seen today, there are still many interesting things that can be seen at the site for anyone wishing to visit the castle. Beginning on the exterior of the castle, down the slope of the rock on the northwest corner, we can get a feel for the formidable natural defense that existed on the north and west side of the castle. We can see here the southwest tower and its turret on the right, the northwest tower and its turret in the center, and the northeast tower on the left. The outer ward wall concentrically follows the shape of the inner ward walls, and we can see a two-turreted entrance from the rock to the outer ward in the center of this image. The gatehouse turrets can be seen rising above the center of the castle as well. Moving to the opposite or southeast corner of the castle, we can get a closer look at the exterior of the southeast tower and the walls of the outer ward as well. The gatehouse can also be seen here, which we will discuss in more detail shortly. The southeast tower along with the northeast tower opposite from it were three stories and had seven-sided rooms that sat above a dungeon-like basement that could only be accessed by a trapdoor in medieval times. At the corner where the gatehouse meets the eastern wall, we can see a latrine which existed here, which also existed at the same location on the other side of the gatehouse. This was accessed from the gatehouse's interior upper floors. On the left side of this image, we can see the corbelled latrine, which when viewed closer, protrudes out from the outer ward wall over the rock-cut ditch on the south side of the outer ward. Edward I's mother, Eleanor of Provence, was a member of the House of Savoy, and her Savoyard family members had close ties with Edward I. In fact, Edward's master mason, who was responsible for the construction of Harlech, James of St. George, was one of these Savoyard connections. He introduced many Savoyard architectural designs to castles in England, including Harlech, 
and this corbelled latrine is an example of the Savoyard influence, as this is a castle feature that you will find often around castles in Savoy. It should be noted that much of the south and east walls of the outer ward were greatly damaged by the sieges that took place throughout the history of the castle. These walls would presumably have been battlemented with crenels and merlons to allow for defenders to fire from safety. Moving to the east within the rock cut ditch, we catch a glimpse of the front of the castle, the northeast tower, and a previously constructed modern wooden staircase that enters the castle. From here, one can see the foundations of the now destroyed bridge towers, which would have protected the castle's approach and would have been one of the later additions to the castle dating to 1323 to 1324. There were two towers that were connected by a long bridge, which can be seen here in this artist's recreation. From here, one can also see the main turreted entrance to the outer ward and the outer ward wall rising up from each side to what would have presumably been its original height. A drawbridge would have pivoted near the base of these protruding turrets and would have connected to the first bridge tower. A new entrance bridge to the castle has since been constructed, which can be seen here. Stepping out of the ditch and looking at the front of the gatehouse, we catch a sense of what the approach to the castle would have been like in medieval times, with the imposing gatehouse standing at the center. All of the corner towers had names that changed over the centuries, with the southeast tower being known as the Garden Tower or Mortimer's Tower, and the northeast tower being known as the Prison Tower or Debtor's Tower. The gatehouse is perhaps the most imposing structure at the castle today, and was part of the first building phase which began in 1283. This gatehouse, along with the northeast and southeast towers and parts of the north and south curtain wall, were all constructed relatively quickly before some of the other areas of the castles were begun. The gatehouse was three floors, a first or ground floor, and two upper floors. Looking at the front of the gatehouse, we can see six windows, the two center of which were an upper and lower chapel on the second and third floors, first and second if you were British. The four outer windows were bedchambers, the top two being on a separate floor from the bottom two. Here is an artist's recreation of how the gatehouse might have looked in the 14th century. The first thing to note is the location of the drawbridge at the entrance of the outer ward that we touched on previously. This would have hinged close to the turreted entrance of the outer ward. At the center of the gatehouse, above the gate passage, which we will touch on in more detail in a moment, we can see the upper and lower chapels along with one of the bedchambers in the southeast corner. All four bedchambers in the gatehouse existed on the side closest to the front of the castle, as indicated by the four windows we saw from the exterior. Note that each chapel had a small vestry attached to each of them, and that the bedchambers were accessed via the doorway which connected to the halls. There were two separate living areas on both floors, split by a wall which connected via a doorway. The northwestern third of the gatehouse on both floors would have contained one of these living quarters, whereas the southwestern two-thirds of the gatehouse on both floors would have had the main living area or hall of the block. The second floor, or first floor in Britain, is thought to have been where the constable lived, the portcullises all being operated from this level, and the third floor, although this can't be conclusively verified, is thought to have been possibly a place for foreign dignitaries or important visitors to the castle. We next move through the outer ward entrance, over where the former drawbridge would have been, into the gate passage of the gatehouse. This passage would have been heavily defended in medieval times, containing two wooden doors and three portcullises along the length of the passage. There are rooms on both sides of this passageway, the left of which is use is not conclusively known, but the right side is assumed to have been a porter's lodge and guard room. We can take a look at the artist's recreation once again, to see where the doors and all three of the portcullises would have been and where the porter's lodge slash guard room would have been as well. Entering the passage and turning around, we can see the view looking back towards the main entrance of the castle. If we turn right into the assumed porter's lodge, here on the ground lie cannonballs which are thought to have possibly derived from the sieges that took place at the castle centuries earlier. In this room is a fireplace which was interestingly connected via a central flue to multiple other fireplaces in the gatehouse on different floors. This central flue, along with another central flue serving more fireplaces on the opposite end of the gatehouse, is largely destroyed, although remains of the other flue can be seen rising above the gatehouse to this day. We can take a look at the artist's recreation once again to see how the flue would have connected to the surrounding rooms in the gatehouse. Looking up in this room facing west, we can see that all the floors of the gatehouse are missing. The corner opening in this image 
connects to the northwest or rear turret of the gatehouse, which held the staircase. This staircase accessed five levels, which included all three gatehouse floors, the gatehouse battlements, and the top of the turrets themselves, which rise higher than the gatehouse battlements. We can see the stair turret extending above the gatehouse in the corner of this picture. The openings in the west wall would have been windows, which we will get a better look at when we look at the rear of the gatehouse. The openings just to the left of these windows would have been doors communicating to the great hall or the other two thirds of the floor. The north wall openings are windows and the east wall openings are a fireplace and the doors that would have led to the bed chambers, the windows of which we saw when looking at the front of the gatehouse. Stone corbels also protrude from the walls, giving perspective to where the floors would have been. Stepping back into the gate passage and looking up, we can see the entrance to the second level, along with the windows of the great hall on the second and third floors. The southwest turret, which contained a stair just as the northwest turret did, can be seen from here as well. Looking at the artist's recreation, we can see that these are the four windows that we are viewing now. Stepping through to the inner ward, we see the western range of buildings now demolished. The western range was split by a hallway which led to the outer ward, the doorway of which can be seen here. The great hall was on the right of this hallway, with the hall's fireplace and windows being visible. Stone corbels mark the level of the roof in medieval times. To the left of the hallway would have been the kitchens, with the entrance being from the courtyard side and the buttery in the pantry existing in the room closest to the hallway. At one point, it is believed that a covered wooden walkway would have ran across the front of this interior wall. This western block is quite substantial, as can be seen when stepping inside the Great Hall. The kitchen connected to the southwest tower, as can be seen here. Quickly stepping through the doorway out into the outer ward, one can catch a glimpse of the outer ward, along with the northwest tower and its turret being seen here. The northwest tower was at different times during Harlech's history, called the Chapel Tower, and the Armor's Tower at one point, and its turret, along with the Southwest Tower's turret, were some of the last works to be completed on the Inner Ward. Stepping back through into the Inner Ward, we can see the back side of the gatehouse. The entrance to the domestic quarters can be seen on the second floor, but all six windows correspond with rooms we discussed previously. The two left windows being in the smaller chamber on the Northwest Third, and the four right windows being in the Great Halls on the Southwest Two Thirds. Again, spiral stairs ran throughout the entirety of the rear turrets. From here, a small portion of the battlements on the gatehouse can be seen, which have been largely destroyed. The artist's recreation can once again give perspective to what the top of the gatehouse and its turrets would have looked like. Looking at a higher angle in a similar position, we can see the two rooms that make up the southern range. The left room is thought to have been a granary, a place to store grains and feed, and the right room is thought to have been the so-called Stingworn Hall, which is thought to have been a Welsh timber-framed hall dismantled from somewhere else and brought to Harlech. The curtain walls above these structures and to the east are interesting in that they slope downwards and have a stair within the slope, perhaps due to the curtain walls in that area not being fully finished. Turning north within the inner ward, we can see the north range of buildings. The chapel is the most prominent feature on this side of the inner ward wall, with a prominent window being visible in the chapel's still standing east wall. The entrance to the chapel would have been gained from the courtyard and the roof would have been angled to lean towards the curtain wall. The area to the left of this chapel is an open yard which gives access to the northwest tower. Looking at another angle from near the southwest tower, we can see that not much remains of the north wall with the exception of the chapel itself. Turning to face the northeast corner, we can see the last remaining section of the inner ward. Although not visible here, there is another door that gives access to the outer ward right on the other side of this wall, which leads out to where the turreted staircase, or north gate, existed in the outer ward. The three windows next to the chapel are thought to have existed within service rooms, and the well can still be seen at the base of the central window. The furthest east door leads to the northeast tower, which was referred to as the prison tower or debtor's tower at certain times throughout its history, as it was where prisoners were held within the walls of the castle. The northeast tower spiral stair can be taken which gives access to one of its floors and subsequently to another staircase which leads up to the wall walk. The curtain wall walks of the inner ward are all accessible and allow visitors to get a grasp of the entirety of the inner ward in all its glory. Although largely destroyed today, 
These walls would have been battlemented when built, which would have put their sidewall height or parapets considerably higher than they stand today. As we take a bird's eye view of Harlech from the southwest, we catch a glimpse of the stunning views that can be seen from the castle and the formidable defensive position that Harlech sits in, which played a major role in it being constructed where it was. If you are interested in visiting Harlech Castle, you can find more information on Kudu's website, link in the description. Okay, this has been a brief look at the history of Harlech Castle in Gwyneth, Wales. This is Brief History signing off. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you on the next one. Cheers. Thank you.